Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your Hurricane Outlook and discussion for Tuesday, June 25th, 2019. Pretty short today, as there is not much to talk about, but there are a few things to discuss, as always. And so, let's get to it, shall we? We'll get rid of the picture of me for a moment, and let's start off here. Going down to Australia, the land down under the Bureau of Meteorology, um, part of the Australian government, their BOM, Bureau of Meteorology, and their ENSO wrap-up, El Nino Southern Oscillation Update. This was issued today, and they will issue another advisory or update on the 9th of July. And what do they say? Well, we can look at a couple of things. First of all, check this out, if this will open for me. The ENSO outlook is now inactive meaning that the immediate likelihood of El Nino developing according to their parameters has passed, with Enso neutral being the most likely scenario through the southern winter, southern winter and spring. So that's it, according to the Bureau of Meteorology, uh, which has a different set of criteria, not vastly different than does the United States-based Climate Prediction Center but the uh, Australians here declaring that El Nino, um, it, it, to them, it never happened. We weren't quite there yet, and it's not going to happen, at least not yet. And uh, so they say that the ocean and atmospheric indicators are now largely at ENSO neutral levels. So that means a lot of things for a lot of places around the globe and in terms of Atlantic hurricane activity. This would suggest no appreciable impacts from the Pacific El Nino event, which seems to be inactive, right, um, on Atlantic hurricane activity. So it seems that all systems would be go for us to have a normal season. No major inhibitors uh, out of the usual. Does that make any sense? I hope so. At least not from an El Nino perspective. Now, again, the United States has a different way in the Climate Prediction Center It's not that much different. It's just a little bit lower um, anomaly, about a half a degree Celsius is what the Climate Prediction Center considers El Nino threshold and for a certain period of time. I'm not going to get into the details today. This is just something interesting. People were talking about it on Twitter, so I thought I'd bring it up here. All right, so there you go. So let's take a look at what's happening in the Atlantic, which is nothing, and you would expect that for June 25th. If things were very busy... That would be very concerning, and we're not sitting in a type of season where uh, the Atlantic is overwhelmingly warmer than normal, et cetera, and, you know, so we would expect things to be very slow in June and July and the first half of August, and you can see here on the satellite imagery as the sun goes by, the sunrise there, um, that line, by the way, between the light and the dark right there, we chase it across. That's called the Terminator, in case you didn't know that. <clears throat> yep, it's true. It's called the Terminator. Look it up. And, of course, you'll see an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie or three or four <laughs> before you get to the astronomical definition of what Terminator is. Um, so as the sun rises, you see this area of dry air and dust push off or advect laterally in the horizontal. Convection is more vertical advection is you know lateral or horizontal and there's even more of it scooting across the deep tropics here a saharan air layer has also made its way into the gulf of mexico through the caribbean and into parts of the southeast i see a lot of people tweeting about sunsets uh, we talked about it a little bit last night on weather brains with james span and uh, other folks um, uh, um what was his name alex bloom And Nate Johnson, myself, were on Weather Brains last night, and we talked about uh, a little bit about the tropics and so forth. And James was mentioning that he has received a lot of pictures of gorgeous sunsets from down here along the Gulf Coast as this dry Saharan air layer pattern has infiltrated the area. Now, Ben Knoll did a great animation here. It's a couple of things I like about this. First of all, it's really cool because you can see the advection and the push of the Saharan air coming in through the main development region, another version of it, or, you know, another episode, that's what I'm looking for, uh, several, several days ago, made its way across and now swirling around in the northwest gulf. But I also like that he put his trademark 
been no weather, right in the nation's heartland. That's cool, man. I like that. That is that is excellent. I love that. You got to put your you got to put your stamp somewhere, and he put it right smack dab in the lower 48. Good job. Uh, and it's a great graphic. There's different versions of this that we see out there. The aerosol um, content of the atmosphere animations. I mean, it's it's amazing what we can see uh, visualization wise these days. And you see that thick Saharan dust coming off. And this is a dry air layer in the mid-levels of the atmosphere. And someone asked the other day, well, how come the westerly shear that comes across uh, this way that we see from time to time doesn't blow against that and prevent it from happening? And that's a great question. And the reason is this air that comes off of Africa is more or less at the lower, at best, the mid-levels of the atmosphere, maybe 500 millibars and down. Right? Remember, the higher up you go, the lower the millibars are in the atmosphere. Right? You understand that, that the atmosphere has thickness. And so at 700 millibars to 500 millibars in the atmosphere, um, basically below 20,000 feet, 18,000 feet, below 18,000 feet, roughly, is where the Saharan air layer resides. At 200 millibars or so, 300, 200 millibars higher up, 30, 40,000 feet, that's where you get these westerly winds, and I'm going to use red here, that will cut across the deep tropics. And so that is above the Saharan air layer blowing this way. And so that's why. Uh, and the two just pass like ships in the night. And that's why the, the westerlies that we see, this wind shear that cuts across the Caribbean and the deep tropics, doesn't blow the Saharan air layer back, and you see it curl up and tail off into the Atlantic. That's a great question somebody asked. I can't remember if it was YouTube or Twitter, but somebody asked the question, and that's awesome. And I hope that explains it. Um, it's because the two air masses are at different layers of the atmosphere. I could have just said that, right? But that's not as fun as explaining it. All right. Uh, in the eastern Pacific, we do have our first named storm, it looks like, on its way. Invest Area 93E. Uh, I called it 91 or something like that yesterday, and it's 93. Remember, the 93 means that it's just a number. They number these 90 through 99 as a way to label an area of interest, and the letter E is for Eastern Pacific. And you see this down here, this uh, red X, about an 80% chance of further development well off the coast of Mexico. We can see that here on the still image, and if we get rid of me once more, and jump over here to the vorticity signature. There it is right there, coming together south of the Mexican coastline, the bundling of that energy. And you can see the energy stretched out across a good deal of the tropics, but it's right here that for whatever reason, and this is the part that we just don't understand, why is this area going to come together and everything sort of aggregate and form into this tropical system, this tropical cyclone that looks like it'll develop. Well, a part of it's the passage of that active Kelvin wave that I talked about yesterday, this energy that comes across that acts like a big fertilizer truck, and in its wake uh, remains this area of general favorability with an increase in moisture, lower shear values, an increase in relative vorticity. The wind uh, at the lower levels are coming in from the west, and you've got this easterly flow naturally in the trade winds over here, and that helps to sort of spin this up. But why the you know, these? What's the absolute switch? Well, that's very difficult to pin down, and sometimes it doesn't matter. They just happen, and we can see this coming together here. And through the gift of Levi Cowan's site here, Tropical Tidbits, we see uh, the satellite animation a small core, if you will, trying, I mean, a core is, I'm being very generous, but a, a small convective mass, but a very large feed of moisture spinning into this system. But I caution you, those of you that are, um, and it's okay to root for a system that's out in the open water as long as shipping interests stay away, right? So for those of you that are saying, go system, go, you know, you want to track something, look at that satellite picture. And tell me what you see in the path of this. Remember, it's going to try to track generally off to the west-northwest with time. And I'll give you a few hints. You know, over in this area, 
You have a lot of bubbling up of the atmosphere, a lot of convective activity associated with the weather pattern there. But what lies off to the west-northwest, starting over here? Low stratocumulus clouds. What causes that? That is much more of a signature of a stable air mass and cooler sea surface temperatures out ahead of this system. Uh, and it's even more so over here with this marine layer that's kind of locked in there. Um, and so this is going to spin up. It's trying to. And it's going to quickly dissipate, uh, it would appear. Water temperatures in its path along this area, warm enough probably until about right here. And then it will start encountering much more of this more stable air mass. And it will meet its demise. The latent heat of the atmosphere will not be as prevalent. Um, some cloud cover streaming north into the Gulf of Mexico, the western Gulf. A little bit of a disturbance here over Central America. But... For whatever reason, these just aren't going to develop. It's very difficult. You, you say, look, you see this convection. Ooh, there's a system here. Maybe that's going to do something. Maybe this will do something. But for whatever reason, the tropics don't, and I think this is a good thing, obviously, they don't just pop everything that has structure to it. And when we go back and look at the vorticity signature, there's really not that much energy out over the Gulf, even though there is some cloud cover. It's trying to concentrate and do its thing right here, the bundling of the heat in one area. We can't, we're not like Jupiter where there's storms everywhere. And we're a much smaller planet than Jupiter. All right, real quick, I'm going to be heading out shortly after posting this video. Uh, I'm down here in the Wilmington, North Carolina area. And I'm going to make my way up Highway 17 through New Bern, Washington, and uh, up to, actually there's a shortcut over here. And then I'm going to head out along 64 to the Outer Banks, and I'm going to go down here to Rodanthe, where we have a nest cam uh, that is set up on a house of a good friend of ours, good friend of mine personally, and a friend to Hurricane Track as a whole. And I'm going to go up there and kind of reposition that nest cam so that it sees more sky and uh, do some other things to, you know, weather it, make it weatherproof. Well, the nest cam itself is in good shape, but... If you plug anything in on the Outer Banks, you know how it is, that salty air. When you have an outdoor plug, you got to do stuff to weatherize it. And I'm going to be taking care of that to make sure it lasts and we don't have any shorts out there and it doesn't short out. So I'm going to be heading up to Rodanthe, and along the way, starting, I don't know, about an hour from now, maybe less, That well, depends on when you watch this video. Right now it's about 2 p.m. Eastern. So by 3 p.m. Eastern, I'm going to stream live. Uh, I'm testing a new... Let me put me back on for a second. I'm using an old iPhone 8 to stream live to YouTube, and I've done that for a couple of years now, but the problem has always been that it gets warm while it's encoding, and it actually gets very warm. And if you're in a hot vehicle or the sun shines on it at all, and people who stream from their vehicles using phones, they know about this. They, they get really hot, and it'll shut off. And uh, it did that last year during Hurricane Michael. We had it set up early that morning of October 10th. And you know, we had several thousand people tuned in. And when we got back to the hotel from setting up the uh, GoPro at Mexico Beach, there was almost 5,000 people watching. And I remember we closed up the Tahoe. Brent and I did the other Tahoe. We have two Tahoes. If you're wondering, whoa, is Tahoe's working again? We have two Tahoes, one that's not working anymore, it's retired, and another one that looks exactly like it that a good friend of ours purchased for us. Same make and model and everything, same year, but it just doesn't have half a million miles on it. And we use that for uh, for Michael. Um, and it, too, is starting to get a little too old. But anyway, back to the story. We uh, I just didn't want you to be like, wait a minute, I thought you didn't have the Tahoe anymore. We kind of do. It's just a different one. Um, but it's not brand new. Anyhow, we closed it up and went inside to talk about what we were going to do with the weather balloon and all that kind of stuff, and which turned out to be nothing because Michael, of course, made landfall a few miles too far to the east. But the iPhone stayed on the dashboard. It's raining. The hurricane's coming. It's not like the sun was shining, but there's no AC running. It's about 80 degrees outside, and the ambient heat in the Tahoe made the iPhone turn off. And couple people that, you know, have my back on the back end of things, you're trying to help me out. They're like, oh, man, you got to get that thing running, and it's just frustrating. So, point is, I think I have a solution. Not going to tell you what it is, because if it doesn't work, I don't want to sound like I'm an idiot. 
But I think it's a very simple, elegant solution. And if it does work, I'll take a picture of it and show you. So long story short, I'm going to test this idea out. It's actually very, very simple. You know the, to the concept of Occam's razor, that you know all things being equal, the simplest solution usually turns out to be um, the solution, the best solution. That's generally what that means. And um, so I'm going to test it out and see if it works. The treat for you uh, is that you'll be able to watch as I travel um, all day today up to the Outer Banks and whatnot if, if you want to. So there you have it. If you have your notifications turned on as a YouTube subscriber, you should get a little ping that marks streaming live. That'll be in about an hour. All right. Also, the uh, documentary is on Amazon Prime Video. <clears throat> it is available for rent or purchase. Probably next year, June 1st of next year, I'll just put it on Amazon Prime so that it's included with Prime. But until then, yes, I need to use it as a fundraiser because this is my business. And in addition to Patreon and um, this, you know, what else? i got to earn an income, right? And I'm going to tell you what, the people that have bought this or rented it, thank you. And your remarks on social media and uh, the reviews that people have left down here, you know, I didn't do these, and a lot of these people, I don't know who they are. These are strangers, and um, I appreciate it. And if you haven't had a chance, check it out. Tracking the Hurricanes 2018, absolutely incredible, especially the ending. I did the music. Um, I'm proud of that. I'm proud of the whole thing. I'm proud of the fact that people supported this, especially our patrons on Patreon, all throughout the off season, stuck with me so that I could do this without having to, you know, go work at Best Buy or something. Nothing against Best Buy, I'm just saying. Got to work on this full time. You got to have an income, and you guys help to make that happen. So thank you for that. Now we have a great documentary, and you can check it out. Amazon Prime Video, Tracking the Hurricanes 2018. And by the way, the 2017 version is also on there, and it is included with Prime. And you can just watch it if you got Prime. If not, it's available for a couple bucks to rent. All right, I'm done. I am Mark Sedeth, HurricaneTrack.com. As always, I appreciate your time and attention. Watching and listening from the other side of whatever device screen you have, I appreciate it. I'll talk to you again, let's see, probably Thursday. Well, of course, I'll see you on the road as I travel up to Rodanthe, but we'll be back here with another update on Thursday.